Um, some of you may have heard the sick old joke about um, the man who'd been marooned on an island for some years. And when he was rescued, uh, the, the people came in the boat and they saw he'd built three you know, not bad structures. And they said, well, what's, what's this one? He said, that's my home. Now, what's that one? He said, oh, that's my church. And they said, what's the third one? Well, that was the church I used to go to, but I had problems there. <laughs> and, um, it is remarkably easy for humans uh, to have problems with ourselves or with others. We, we are going to look at this extraordinary statement about uh, from the Crete, and I'm, I've got a little picture here. There you go. That's got nothing to do with anything, but it's a nice picture. Let's pray that God would uh, speak to us. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would... Uh, that we would give you the freedom to reshape our thinking uh, on the church, on uh, the people who belong to Jesus and our place in it. Please, by your Holy Spirit, guide me in what I say and don't say. And we pray that you may even change us uh, through our time together now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, if you're new uh, here or haven't been here for a while, we have been working our way through the Apostles' Creed. Um, it's... Uh, from about 200 AD or perhaps a bit earlier, Christians have been saying it, uh, like we heard in the little uh, movie, in, well, over 100 different languages today, millions and millions and millions of human beings will say, this is what we believe. It's got the three clear parts. I believe in God, the Father, the Creator. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son. And then I believe we believe in the Holy Spirit, which is the sort of heading for the third section, which we're moving down through for the next couple of weeks. And we come there to the church. Now, John Stott is a very impressive uh, a Christian man from England. Um, if I know many of you will have read books by him or perhaps listened to talks by him. But um, even if you haven't, if you've been in Anglican churches, you have been influenced by him. Uh, if you go to an Anglican church that teaches from the scriptures... Most ministers have been seriously influenced by John Stott's wisdom and scholarship and insight. But he made a comment that I heard years ago, and I, I kind of believe it, perhaps in the same way as we might believe the statements that we've said in the Creed about believing in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. He says this, uh, and I've ignored this a couple of times. He said, if I was starting... Uh, a position as the rector of a Christian community, I would spend the first year preaching on the church what it is, why it is, what its calling and job is. He said so much of the Christian life and community life is sorted out if we get this clear. And he said most of us haven't got it clear. Now, I believe that because I'd be a fool to argue with John Stott. He can be wrong. He's not the Pope and the Pope can be wrong. So um, he can be wrong. But I've never done it. You know, the times I've started in, in new ministries, I've never started with that. So you've got to ask, well, Ian, do you really believe it? Uh, but he is saying something very significant, that when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, it's, really, it's, it's very logical, the next statement that talks about the church. Pentecost is the day when we remember the Holy Spirit coming afresh in a new and powerful way on the early church. Um, and it is also called the birthday of the church. Those two things are almost synonymous. The Spirit comes to the church. He then grows the church. So to, to believe in the Holy Spirit takes you straight away to the question of the church. Well, let's have a look at it today under three possible headings. Um, this is the part that we've just said that we're working through. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. In the Nicene Creed that we'll probably say next week, which is from about 200 years later and it's a bit longer and fuller, it says we believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. So there are one or two words replaced and the addition of the word. Well, one isn't really an addition because what it says in the Apostles' Creed is we believe in the, which implies one. Uh, the addition there is the word apostolic. So we're going to look today at these three things. The con we want to go from confusion to clarity on the creed, from being casual to careful, and from being careless to crucial. Um, so let's have a look at this first one together. From confusion to clarity. Now, what am I on? Where's the confusion? 
Well, I think I was chatting with someone just yesterday who remembered that when uh, she was a teenager and she went to a church for the first time that she noticed where they said the Apostles' Creed. And she was kind of irritated by it, annoyed by it, for this part. What do you mean we believe in the Catholic Church? If we weren't a Catholic Church, we'd be in a Catholic Church. We're an Anglican church. What are you guys on about, your clowns? And that's an understandable thing. Why do we say, again, 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 what, why don't we just change the word? If the, if the word is uh, confusing... Well, I personally, I don't like changing the words of creeds because I think the creeds have been given to us after um, hundreds and hundreds of years of careful thought by wiser Christians than me. And it's, there's something significant. In fact, these are the words that they chose, English translation of it. What do we mean when we say the church even? Well, as, as Andrew's mentioned, it means fundamentally the gathering. Many of you will know that in Acts chapter 18, there's a riot by people who want to drive the Christians out of town. And the, original, the word in the original language is they had an ecclesia, which is where we get our word ecclesiastical church, etc. And um, it was a riot, but it's called a church. Because the fundamental meaning of church is gathering. It's the gathering of Christ. That's what it is. You can have all sorts of gatherings. The Christian church is the gathering of Christ the people who Christ has gathered together around him. Now, one of the reasons you may or may not have noticed uh, that when we were doing the live stream off and on for a couple of years during the plague, um, thanks particularly to Andrew Vella's insistence at the first time we had a meeting to talk about it, was we we decided we were never, ever going to call it church. Because it isn't. It may have some of the things that happen you know, on your screen that happen in church, but it can't be church because church means a gathering. And if you haven't gathered, you haven't had church. So you may have had some of the ingredients. Now, you can turn it into church. When you said that, if you gather some people together and, and maybe pray and, and, and have some fellowship as well, you can, you can have church around some of the input, but you simply cannot replace one with the other. If you're housebound, and some people are, the sort of those church services can be a blessing, but they're not church. Uh, you have to church means to gather. But we believe in the Catholic Church. Now that's where it gets confusing, doesn't it? Well, look, the first time we know of any Christian using the word Catholic was by a guy called Ignatius of Antioch. It was about 100 AD. He was on his way to Rome to be put to death, and he wrote a number of letters. And he speaks about the Catholic Church. He is not talking about anything that in his mind is focused on Rome. Right? Whereas it's the Roman Catholic Church that people are confused about. He just meant the church spread across the world, not individual little segments with particular flavors, but the broad sweep, as uh, Phil said, you know, through time and, and uh, backwards and forwards and all over the place. So it's, not, it's saying our little group is not the church. Now, some of you, I, I know, have, been, have spent time in little groups that pretty much say, we are the only church. I was chatting with a guy this week who grew up in a very small, uh, well, it was really a sect, um, which said, we are the only true church. Now, you can pretty much guarantee that if you're in a group of however big it is that says, we are the true church, there's something faulty. with. They may well be Christians. The, the saying that Catholic is saying, we believe it's not just whatever racial group we might be. It's not just our sort of people. Right? I remember uh, talking with the minister, and God did an extraordinary work down in Hobart, and a whole lot of wild young men and women became Christians, They're covered in tats, weird stuff going on with their hair, etc. And then some of the some of the old term members of the church said, "We don't want those sort of people at our church." So in the end, this Presbyterian minister left their church and started the church with these kids off the street. And he was absolutely right. When we start thinking about our church, our sort of people, um, alarm bells should go off. We're a weird bunch, which is why we need to be loving and patient and kind and forgiving and forbearing with each other, because if people from different cultures and types of people annoy each other, that's when we grow up as Christians. So when we say Catholic, like, like Ignatius of Antioch was saying, it's the whole church. The word uh, Catholic comes from these two, in the, in the Greek, it comes from these putting together of two words, meaning according to the whole. Uh, just reminding us that we're part of something huge. And I thought it was very helpful to have that, the creed said in different languages to remind us of that. So I think, and I, you know, I think I can say this without, no, no, I can't. You can accuse me of being a terrible bigot if you like, but I ain't. Um, 
as I can say, some of my best friends are Roman Catholics and my relatives are. But I think the Roman Catholic Church, now this may surprise you that the Christian Church could ever do something that was less than perfect. Would that shock you? Get ready for it. The, the Roman Catholic Church, when it changed its name from the Roman Catholic Church to the Catholic Church, which they did officially in, in our communication sometimes, in the, I think it was, might have been in the 50s or 60s, was very naughty. Imagine if the Anglican Church changed their name to the Christian Church. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That word doesn't belong to you clowns. Or even if we just change it to the church. Right? Uh, you know, Catholic means... So when it used to be called the Roman Catholic Church, that was a very good name for it. It's part of the Catholic Church with its headquarters in Rome. In the old prayer book, which is sort of the constitutional document of the Anglican Church, what we called, what we might now call the Catholic Church, and I almost will never use that phrase when I'm talking or writing things. I've just I've used a fuller name because I think it's helpful. It's actually called the Church of Rome. Right? That's what the, because that's what it is. It's the church with its headquarters in Rome. Part of the Catholic Church. One of the things I like about the Anglican Church is it doesn't take itself too seriously. Right? It knows we're just a small, somewhat peculiar part of a wonderful big thing that God is doing. One Catholic. Well, what about the word holy? Well, as again, as, as Phil said, it's great. Phil says it clearly and I can ramble on and make it unclear. The, the, the word holy in the, in, the, in the Old Testament language comes from the idea of cutting something and separating it. So you can do it with a piece of wood, you can do it with a piece of meat. It's the idea of being separated from something for a special use. So it's not actually saying a person who's holy is particularly prayerful, although they probably should be, or particularly kind, although they should be. It's saying they've been set apart and they belong to God. So God is holy, and, which reminds us that he's not like us. He's not part of the creation. He is holy. And the church is holy. What does that mean? It means it belongs to God. More specifically, it belongs to Jesus. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, I will build my church. It's his church or it ain't a church. So it's not my church. In a sense, it's not your church, but it is because we, we, we go to it. We've got to keep right. It's Jesus' church. So the question always is, what does Jesus think? What does Jesus want? It doesn't matter at all what I want. And I'm, I'm very aware of this. This is not my church to make it in whatever shape I like. Choose the music that I like. Choose the Bible that I like. Right? It's rubbish. It is. So the question is, what does Jesus think? When it comes to what we believe, what does Jesus believe about this? One of the silliest comments people make, and sometimes even people in church do this, we say things like, I like to believe God is... In a sense, with all due respect, who cares what you like to think? The question is, what does Jesus think? If we're Christians, that's what it means. He is our teacher. He is our Lord. Some of what he says we're going to really like, some of which we're going to, he's going to say we're not going to like. If you want to explain it away, you can. Right? It won't go away. It's his church. It's a holy church. The, other, the last thing in terms of going from confusion to clarity, hopefully, is where we say we believe in the communion of saints. Now, the communion means really that, that uh, things that come, have come together, they're, they're really united closely. But the word saints. And again, this has been confused sometimes by the church at times. Because the word saint, we, we can't help but think sometimes it means someone's a super Christian. You know, like there are rugby players and there are wallabies. Right? That sort of thing. We can say that without feeling too much shame today, which is nice. But um, uh, for those of you not interested in trivia, that's okay. But um, it, saint is the most common word in the Bible to describe a believer in Jesus. So I became officially a saint in 1974, the moment I became a Christian. So it's not something you get awarded for good work, you know, like an OBE or something like that. You, you become it, you say, Jesus, I'm yours, I'm trusting you. He says, and you're one of my people. You're a saint. Uh, not in the sense of, you know, super Christian. So we, and what we say is we believe about a particular relationship between the saints, the people of God. Hopefully that's um, clearish, those terms. The church, holy, Catholic, saints. Um, we had the CMS summer school, uh, CMS uh, lunch and a dinner thing last night. It was fantastic. It was just, I, I thought it was going to be good, but it was, I'm not trying to make you feel the pain if you weren't there. But um, 
a little bit of pain won't do you harm if you could have been there, but um, uh, it was great, and it'll be on again next year. But I remember going to CMS Summer School as a young Christian, and they had a cross there. I don't know if they've still got it there. Someone can tell me that they had this in the sort of a light blue background with uh, writing, All One in Christ Jesus from the New Testament. They still have that sign up there, don't they? All One. It was just very helpful because things like missionary organisations and all sorts of people from various different parts of the Christian church meet there. And it was just a great statement from the Scriptures. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So that hopefully that's uh, reasonably clear. So when we say the creed, we can say it with confidence. Uh, even that word that seems a bit odd, Catholic. Well, secondly, uh, we want to go now from casual to careful. Uh, there are sometimes when to be careless is deadly. Uh, and sometimes to be careful is wise and joy bringing. And so I want to do that with you by looking at Acts chapter 20. Uh, there are a number of speeches in the book of Acts. You know, you get, there's the Gospels and then Jesus dies for us, rises, ascends to be back with his Father, and then he sends the Spirit and out goes the church as the instrument of the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, you have the story of the Gospel spreading out until finally it gets to Rome at that point. Because, you know, the Gospel got to all sorts of places before it got to Rome. It got to Ethiopia long before it got to Rome. Uh, any idea we have that Romans... You will get this point that it's the main city of... Because it's just not. You know, the gospel was in Egypt long before it got to Rome. It was in uh, all sorts of parts of Turkey, etc. Um, but the gospel does get to Rome, which then was the capital of the city, uh, capital of the empire, so it was a significant moment at that moment. And you've got all sorts of sermons recorded, in Acts chapter 2 and then Acts 7 and all sorts of... And they're all sermons to people who aren't Christians... So they were reading to learn, how do we talk about Jesus to people who don't know him? But Acts 20 is completely different. Acts 20 is a chapter that I want to encourage you to read. Uh, when in doubt, have a look at Acts 20. For um, It's rich, it's so rich. But it's the only sort of speech given to a group of Christians. So if you want to know what the, what the, new, the early church thought that Christians should be on about... Acts 20, where the Apostle Paul is on his way to Jerusalem and he talks to the elders or the leaders of the church. And I want us to, to just see what the things that just are assumed about being Christian. And how does Christianity start? How is the church born? How is the church kept healthy? Uh, we'll see it here. Just, just touching on these things really, really quickly. Firstly, in the middle of the chapter, which you heard read, uh, we're called a flock, which assumes that we are sheep constant picture in the Bible, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. Right? And um, how does it start? Well, it's born by the preaching of the gospel. Uh, so he says, I, I testified the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This is what happens. The apostle Paul comes into Ephesus and he brings the, the, the gospel of the apostles, which is a message of God's grace and kindness. And it calls people to, as he says in verse 21, the people must repent and have faith in the Lord Jesus. There has to be a, a, a U-turn where we say, okay, I'm now going to face Christ as Lord and King. Uh, that's, and I'm going to trust him for my forgiveness, this gracious one. So that's, where the, that's sort of the DNA. That's the, that's the um, impregnation where the, where the whole thing starts is from that gospel, the apostolic gospel. How does the church grow in health? Or well, verse 32... Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. The way that the church grows and stays healthy and gets cleansed is through the word of his grace. And so that that's what he commits the church to. He's, going, he's not going to see him again. So they just need to be those who pay attention to the word of his grace. And um, that's how they get healthy and stay healthy. Now in verse 29 we get to the part that, that is uh, important and particularly in going from being careless to careful or casual to careful. Listen to what it says in verse 19. Sorry, verse 29. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Now just let your ears turn to eyes for a moment. You've got some sheep and some wolves come. Very bad news for the sheep. This is a picture that, that the Apostle Paul gets from Jesus who says that, you know, False teachers, he describes them as wolves in sheep's clothing. That is a very... We often take for granted the, the genius of Jesus. 
Such a scary picture. A wolf dressed up like a sheep, coming in amongst the sheep, intending on death and murder. Verse 30, even from among your own numbers, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. So the Apostle Paul always knew that life for the Christian person, for the disciple of Jesus, for the child of God, is dangerous. And we've looked at this in the past. If you are not aware that the journey between today and the day you stand before God in judgment and are welcomed or rejected, that it's a dangerous journey, you're very unlikely to make it. If there's real danger and there's enemies, and you don't take them seriously, you're making yourself really foolishly vulnerable. Don't do it. Unless you want to say that Jesus simply doesn't know what he's on about, and neither did the first apostles. This is a common picture for them. It's, so it's worth knowing that for the, for the Christian people, it's actually a dangerous journey. You have to be alert right? and not ca- overly casual. But here's some great news, because just before that, you get a picture of who you really are. Look at it in verse 28. Verse 28 is just a fantastic verse. He says to the leaders of the church, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Two people we've got to stand guard over. Ourselves and all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of. Be shepherds of the church of God. Here's the key phrase. Which he bought with his own blood. This is a very important thing for you to realize. You look around yourself. We look around ourselves here at the Christian church. Who are we? We are the people that God has bought with his son's blood. You want to know how important you are? Don't look at your pay pack or whether you got that job or not. That's irrelevant. Look at what God thinks you're worth. He paid a price for you. The way you can tell how much someone values something is what they're willing to pay for it. So for most people in Australia, the most valuable thing, the most expensive thing we have is a house, isn't it? Right? That's where we, we pay it off for 25 years just in time to die and let someone else pay it off for the next 25 years. That's how the game works. But, you know, we, but then most of us, if we've got people that we love, we've got, yeah, that's the most expensive thing I've ever bought, but if it was a choice between the safety and et cetera, of this person or this house, the house goes. I used to say that in theory about my parents, and then they did it for one of their children. Right? That the, the wealth that they'd built up in that, in spite of the advice given to them by friends, I said, no, 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 this... This money is needed here right? because that's actually more valuable. So you want to know what something is worth, see what someone's willing to pay for it. What are you worth? What are we worth? Because the Bible uses the same picture for both. We're worth, you are worth. St. Matt's Waniasa, the whole church, is worth the blood of God's Son. There ain't nothing more precious or valuable to God than you. You may not feel it. No one may acknowledge it. You may be feeling worse about yourself because you've been sick and you can't do much or because you're getting old and now people need to help you where you used to help other people and it felt good. But you are, your value is fixed. Um, a man who I had a lot of time for, Mark, was very, an utterly brilliant lawyer in one particular area that's actually impacted almost all of us probably, and um, I remember going to his house. It was a nice house in Bondi Junction, which is nice. It was nice. But everyone else in his position, senior partners in that law firm, they lived by the water. They lived on the harbour. They overlooked Bondi Beach. Not this place. He had more important things to do with his money. He was a Christian man. So he didn't live where all of his peers lived. But when he bought the house, he got it cheap. And he... he he bought it at the point when the Australian, the Sydney property market had completely crashed, apparently. I don't know when that was, 80s somewhere. And um, he had this conversation. And Mark's a loving man, so he, he didn't tell this story with any joy. Some people would say, ha ha, look how clever I am. He wasn't like that. He said, but the man said, but Mark, it's worth more than that. My house is worth more than that. And Mark had to say, friend, it's not. It's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. You may have paid more than I'm paying for it. You may have expected it to rise and rise and rise like we do. He said, it's not worth more than that. It's worth exactly as much as someone's willing to pay for it. 
What's God willing to pay for his church? The blood of his son. The suffering of his son. You may have had bad experiences with church. You may be critical of church, etc. That's understandable. But be careful that you're not arguing with God about how precious and valuable you are. And we are the people of God. We're born by the gospel. Health comes from the word of God. It's a position of danger. Great value. Right? And that's why we do the Lord's Supper again and again and again, isn't it? They keep saying, he loves you. Look at what he paid for you. Don't ever forget that. And the nature of the church is at the very end where he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is what Christians do, isn't it? We learn this from Jesus. We give and we give. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm not going to turn this into a fundraising thing for the church, but, you know, for the building. But if you've got a couple of million dollars, you may be the only person who gives a million dollars to this and set the church free from decades of debt. Good. So, but yeah, but other people aren't giving. I know there are people who've got at least as many houses as I've got. So what? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus says that. It's not me, the fundraising rip-off recto who just wants to get your money out of your account into, into ours. No, no, no. It's simply a fact. Whether it's your time or any of your possessions, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's what Jesus does. That's what the apostles do. That's what the church does. Moving on. So we do need to be not casual about Christian life and church life, but understand how important and precious it is and how threatened it is by false teaching and liars. It's the bride of Christ, so it's valuable. Don't mess, you know, don't hurt Alison or I'll try and remember how I used to punch people um, or my children. But that is Jesus' view of the church. It's his bride. You are part of his bride. It's a huge privilege. Well, lastly, thirdly, to move from from being careless to crucial. What do I mean about this? Look, my hunch is that most 20th, 21st century Westerners, if we had to leave out one or two lines from the creed, you know, if you had to say, okay, it's too long, we've got to leave out a couple of lines. Right? You might want to leave out the sender to the place of the dead that Andrew took us through a few weeks ago. But this would be the one I reckon most Christians, we wouldn't have even thought to put this in the creed, frankly. We'd go, the Father, fantastic. The Son, amazing. The Holy Spirit, who could live without him? And then we go straight on to the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the dead, you know, life everlasting. Oops, left out the church. Because right? we just, we're mad, crazy individualists. That is not progress. It's just what our culture's done to us. So we don't tend to take churching all that seriously. At least that's my suggestion. I think the evidence points us in that way. I think that would be the thing that we might leave out. You might like to uh, discuss that afterwards if you think that things that we might. But here's the danger with that. Hundreds of years ago, a man called Voltaire, a Frenchman who didn't like Christianity at all, said if we're going to destroy Christianity, which was his hope and intent, we need to destroy the Sabbath. Right? The day which was set aside for rest and church. The Lord's Day. Not just a day off. It is that. It's the Lord's Day. We do know from the early writings that the early Christians began to meet, not on Saturday, but on Sunday. I could care less what day it is in a sense. But the, the key thing is, Voltaire knew that if you want to destroy Christianity, you've got to destroy this thing that they do where they stop, no matter how mad and busy they are, and church together. You know the Koreans, we've shared this, the, the, the story of the church getting to Korea, part, according to a man I heard who'd done some study on it, few people had tried to bring the gospel to them. They didn't trust white fellas because they knew what a bunch of thieving criminals we were. And so some of them got put to death, but they left some Bibles in Chinese script. And a number of the Koreans could read it. So they actually were left with the scriptures. And when finally some more missionaries came across, they discovered there was already a church, a gathering of Christians formed just out of the, out of the scriptures, the New Testament. And this is the thing that surprised the people who made contact with them. They had kind of everything right. The Trinity, also, they might have used the same words, but they'd worked it all out from the scriptures. You know the one area where they were dreadfully out of step with the rest of the Christian church? They met every day. <laughs> right. They met every day because they read it in the book of Acts. 
that the early Christians in Acts chapter 2 met every day. So, that, okay, that's what we do. And it's not uncommon for Christians in Korea to still meet very more regularly than we do. But the idea of destroying it will, of course, really, really help weaken Christian. And I want to suggest to you, Voltaire's dreams have pretty much come true in 21st century Australia. For most of us, Sunday's not all that different from Saturday. It's a day off. It's a day to fill up our calendar with all sorts of fun things or our children's fun things. To remember that we're not only Christ's bride, but we are the body of Christ. That's what the Bible says. You want to know who you are, who we are? We are members of the body of Christ. We need each other. You need me. I need you. We need each other. We have the communion of saints, is what the creeds, which is we have this tied up together. If you think you can just turn up every so often to various acts of Christian fellowship, it's about as silly as my liver thinking. If it just reattaches to the body every couple of weeks for a few minutes, it'll be fine. No, it won't. It'll be dead. And worse than that, others will die because of its death. Others will be critically weak because it's so unwell. We are the body of Christ. Um, My wife's uh, learning how to become a midwife at the moment. And the stuff she comes back with is unbelievable about the human body. I mean, I already knew the thing that with... Because there's this communion between the, the mother and the baby, both in the womb and afterwards. So as you know, that, well, unless it's all changed in the last few minutes, women are advised to eat lots of cheese and stuff like that and, and Guinness and things like that to get lots of calcium. Otherwise, the woman, because she's in communion with the baby, she will, she, she will lose the calcium in her bones so that the baby can be well constructed. That's communion. The other thing I've just discovered that Alison just discovered was this. If, if a woman gives birth to a baby and it's sort of a few weeks early... This completely accidental construction of the human body, the woman's body works out that this baby will need different stuff so it can catch up with the weeks it's missed inside the womb. So the chemistry of the milk is different. There are these very clever scientists in the, in the woman's breast who think, okay, we need a bit more of this chemical. Right? And that's communion, you see, because they're saying the woman's, is, her body is saying, I, I'm here for this little guy and I will damage myself even like as, as they can with calcium and bones. That's what it is to be in communion. I want, I want you to ask whether or not when it comes to Christian fellowship you are like the baby or like the mother. Are you a person who lives thinking what, what, do, what do these people need? What can I give? Or are you really like a baby? There's nothing wrong with being a baby. If you've you only just become a Christian, that's exactly who you are and that's perfect. Or are you the sort of person who says, no, no, I just, I just turn up and see what happens rather than coming in order to be a blessing, seeking what good you can do to others in conversation, even as you sing together, to lift, each, lift the voices up and to encourage each other as you do it. This is what the, this book is saying. We belong to the church and the church is the communion of saints. And yet we've got all these... Cr- we've talked about this, haven't we? But you know, be- here's the thing. Because so many of us come to church so rarely, I never know what you've learnt. So I never know whether I'm repeating myself ad infinitum. And if it's important, it's worth repeating itself. But here's the thing. When I got saved in 1974, and yes, there was life in Australia of white fellas in 1974, it was, just, it was a known fact that if you were keen on Jesus, you went to church twice on Sunday. The only people who didn't were people who taught Sunday school. Right? You served in the morning, you went to church in the evening. The average in our church and in most churches in Canberra and is twice a month. If you're a fanatic, three times a month. Right? Now, do you think that makes any difference to your spiritual health? If you go to sort of the, all the blessing and strength that can come from the growth of being together twice a month as against eight times a month, that we don't do it is evidence of our sickness. And I want to suggest to you it's almost serious enough to call it cancer. And then it makes us weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. 
Because, brothers and sisters, the reasons why we don't come to church are normally pathetic, possibly sinful. It's not my call. Now, of course, if you're sick, particularly during COVID time, don't come. But that will be a, a reluctant decision made. I was chatting with someone at the CMS dinner last night, and she was saying, she said, what's... She was just puzzled. She said, the most common reason given why people don't come to our Bible study group is because they're tired. Right? Are they tired because they've been going to too many Bible studies? Surely if, if, if the, the area that you should tax or take time off is the thing that is exhausting you. But of course, if, if you love money... You won't take off time from work, even though that's the thing that keeps demanding and demanding and demanding and demanding and demanding, demanding, because it produces the money, and we love money, don't we? But we don't. We say, oh, no, I'm tired. Or it's raining. How often have you not gone to work because it's raining? Or even if you play sport, you know, as long as it wasn't called off, you win if it was raining. We, we, we we, We don't get it. We are just casual and we should be very focused. There are a million... I got a do- I've got three daughters and one of my daughters lives in Canberra and she was just noticing in a very... Just, she was just puzzled. She said, I've just, I've just noticed that I have a different attitude to church than most of my friends and she goes to a great church. She said, um, said for, for our family, it's we're going to church. That's just a given. That's a fixture. And if they can't go in the morning because something's on, they go in the evening. Right? But she said, I get the impression with, with my friends, and they're, 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 I've met a lot of them, they seem to be lovely Christian people. She said, every weekend, it's will we go or not go? And yet we don't do that with so many other areas, even going to the gym or playing golf or all sorts of things, we go. Right? And this is part of the sickness, brothers and sisters. We don't really believe in the communion of saints. We don't take seriously our need of each other and using the time that we have well together. So ask yourself what happens on your holidays. That's a good indicator when you've got complete discretion. I was somewhat relieved because I knew this passage was coming, this sort of stuff was coming up. I looked back on our holidays. We were on holidays for two Sundays and Alice and I got to go to church three times. Once to a carriage church up at Noosa that had been part of a friend's life and then once a little house church in the bush with some friends and then once down at Nowra, when we got to down at Terrera in time. Why am I... Because I, just, I do keep an eye on it. Am I just a hypocrite? Am I a person who goes on about coming to church? Because, yeah, hey, that's, that's, that's my job. You know. I was kind of relieved to find it wasn't. What do you do during your holidays? Are you meeting with Christian people? Or does God go on holidays? The devil's not going to have a go at you? When you're on holidays, that's exactly the time I'll ever go at you. I remember, you know, uh, a member of our church who used to be a missionary in a foreign country just commenting in times past that he said he'd be in this city. It's not, a nice, it's not quite a nice place to visit. And people who were supporters of CMS, etc., would ring him and say, hey, look, you know, we're, we're in town. Can, can we take you out for dinner, which is nice? We said, well, you know, we're, we're fairly busy. Um, why don't you come to church on Sunday? Oh, no, no, I've got a, I've got a tour organised somewhere. Right? You've got all the time off of the week because you're on holidays. But the meeting of the bride of Christ, no time for that. Right? Now, sometimes you can't get to a place. That may be true. Right? You might say, but yeah, but Ian, what's the point of going? Because this was in an English-speaking church. And frankly, in most capital cities, there's plenty of English-speaking churches, wherever you are. But so what if they, if they speak whatever language they speak in that place that I'm talking about, right? Go there. Just be with the saints. It'll, it'll bring them... And if they're small, it'll bring them encouragement. And give a, a massive amount of money in the plate. Because, brothers and sisters, if we're overseas having a holiday, we are very, very wealthy. In Uganda, I was impressed to see that when you go to various national parks, it says if you're Ugandan, you put in... Almost nothing. But if you're a foreign tourist, I can't have how much. And I thought, that's perfectly fair. If I travel by plane and stay in hotels to visit their country, I'm filthy rich. It's more blessed to give than to receive. we just got to think, am I a member of the Church of God? Is the Church Catholic? Right? Yes, it is. 
We're so much products of our culture that we're radical individualists and it damages us and it damages others. When you feel like not going to church, can I suggest to you that is exactly the time you need to be at church. It's like when you don't feel like praying. You really need to pray when you feel like not, I don't want to talk to God anymore. Really? There's a tribal group in Rwanda, and apparently they meet, it's not the whole of Rwanda, but they meet, and here's the conversation they have in their language. You meet someone and you say, how are you? And the response they give is, I am well if you are well. And then the other person tends to answer, I am well, so we are, so we are well. It's an interesting interaction. How are you? Well, I'm okay if you're okay. Well, I'm okay, so we're okay. Can I suggest that is the way mature Christians, not the babies, the ones who are more like the mothers, that, that's the way that we should be thinking. So I was chatting with a friend and he was saying that when he sometimes contacts people who aren't at church, have been to church for a while, he notices they're not there, and he, the instinctive question is to ask, how are you going? And yet at one level, perhaps just as good a question is to ask, do you know how I'm going? Treating them rather than a, more like a mother than a baby and saying, if... if, if if we just don't bother to go to church or life group or whatever else, too busy, too tired, whatever else, it's raining, right? What we're partly saying is not just I'm happy for myself to sort of starve myself a little bit, but we're also saying I don't really care much about encouraging others, right? Which is part of why we should be coming to church prayerful. I hope that you pray before you come to church and God, please, is there someone I can help? Is there someone who's on the edge of despair and I can be loving and kind to them? Right? That's what it is to be Christians, to be Christ-like at church. So, well, I know you'd like me to say all the other things on this page, but I won't. So this is the church. We say we don't leave out. We believe in the one holy Catholic church and the communion of saints. This is the body of Christ you belong to. This is the bride of Christ you're either snubbing or coming to love and serve. This is the army of Christ that needs encouraging. Or the way that some of the early Christians used to say, it's the hospital of Christ where you will receive health and be an opportunity to bless others. So when we say, I believe in a church, I'm hoping you're not quite as silly as I am when I say, yeah, I I reckon what John Stott says is right. Come to a church And for 12 months, this is a Jesus-obsessed man, but for 12 months, preach about the church. Because if you get that right, you get almost everything else right. If you get it wrong, and friends, I think our culture, our Christian culture has got it seriously wrong. Uh, Much else that's sad will happen as well. So you might come to church every day between now and Christmas. Give yourself a nasty shock. Let's pray. Father, we know that your ways are soft and not our ways and that you have called us to not be conformed to the world that we live in with our foolish individualism. And we do pray, our God, that you would help us to view your church the way you view it, to be willing to repent of ways that we have thought or acted or planned that may not really be in accord with your way. Thank you that you are the God of grace and love and fresh starts. Help us, Lord, to be loving to each other this day. In Jesus' name, amen.